Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Welcome to the Dementia Care Partner Podcast, sponsored by Positive Approach to Care Certification Programs. Would you like to be trained in Tifa Snow's methods and help your community? PAC certification programs can do just that. Train, coach, consult, and engage to help change the culture of dementia care one mind at a time. Certification events are run virtually or in person to help fit your likes, wants, and needs. And this month, we're offering the Amanda Mosher Scholarship to celebrate one of our certified community members. To learn more about the courses and the scholarship, please visit tipasnow.com forward slash certifications. And Tipa, one of the problems we face with our program is that we've got roughly 10 minutes and we can never get in all the topics that people would like information on. So today we're going to try something a little different. We'll call it sort of rapid fire and hopefully provide a, a few answers or some ideas to the questions that we receive. So first one, managing sleep and dementia, sundowners, deliriums, diffusing, ang oh, wait, stop me if you want to get jump in here because I've got a list. Phew. All right. So we're going to, as I understand it, you're going to give me like a minute or two to address each topic. Managing sleep and dementia. There you go. Managing sleep and dementia. Early in dementia, it's a great idea to come up with some sleep hygiene patterns. But if you try to change things too quickly or too intensely, often you have a war on your hands. So looking at what you can do to support healthy sleep is a great idea. Learning to live with new sleep patterns is also something you might want to think about how you're going to do it for your own sleep well-being, as well as the person you're supporting, because there are certain dementias like a Lewy body where nighttime sleep is almost impossible for them, but daytime sleeping works great for them. So the question becomes, when do you hire helpers to be there at night so you can get your rest and then... They sleep during the day, you get some work done, and then you're available in the evening for some social time. So did you just describe sundowners? <laughs> I could, because that could also be something else that could happen, where what happens is as the day wears on, my brain wears out, the chemistry gives out, and I start having more and more issues with trying to do things that in the morning I was fine doing by afternoon, I'm getting lost in time and place and I'm not able to hold on to data. And so that means my hippocampus is not working, which means my primitive brain is getting distressed, which means my thinking brain shuts down and we're all in trouble if we don't figure out how to change place, person or activity to better meet my discomfort so that we can get back on track and I can get a break and you can take a break and trying to keep me in a space with people that I don't wanna be with and tell me that I'm wrong and you're right is the least effective way to get me to start to get to a place where we can get ready for the evening. And I know it's been two minutes, so, okay. Deliriums, UTIs, et cetera. Ah, delirium. Delirium is a rapid onset of a brain change, not the gradual onset or the changes that happen with dementia. So a delirium means, wow, something just happened to my brain. It's not working right. It can be caused by an acute inflammation. It can be caused by an infection. It can be caused by oxygen deprivation. It can be caused by medication interaction or side effects or toxicity. It can be caused by dehydration or malnutrition or overtaking some things that would be supplements, but instead I've taken too much and now I'm out of whack, my electrolytes. Um, but what we really want to appreciate is when we see a delirium, um, it's usually a good idea to find out its, its source, where is it coming from. It could be as simple as somebody that usually is my carer is out of town and I've got new people and I don't know how to handle that and my brain becomes acutely distressed. What I would say is, as the disease progresses, we have to be really thoughtful, though, is this delirium something that we need to treat with antibiotics if it is an infection, or is it getting us anywhere? Oh, aspiration pneumonia. Forgot about that one. Um, or is it a time for us to go, okay, this is the fifth time we've done this in three months. I'm wondering if it's time to rethink our game plan because the deliriums are simply because the dementia is progressing to an end state. Next one almost ties back into a little bit of what you said. That's diffusing anger. 
Mm. So if somebody's really getting irritated and then they become angry, what we don't want is them to become furious because furious is an out of control state of emotion where I have no control, no impulse control, no thinking, no good decision making. I can be incredibly free of restraint and I can be very strong, very quick and very nimble just because I think somebody's trying to cause me harm. So diffusing anger means I want to come right up underneath the person and, and make sure I'm turned so that I'm slightly turned alongside the person off to the side, at least at arm's length. And I want to say to them, you're getting really angry about this. And I hold my hands out there. This thing is not working. And you can hear me pounding my hand. But what I'm doing is drawing the anger into my hand motion and not into our relationship. I am, that should never have happened. I am so sorry that, ha oh, you thought, oh, wow. And whatever they say, it's a reflection that I got your message, you're ticked off. And gradually my goal is to bring the anger down to a simmer, down to irritation and, and then apologize. Be careful about trying to apologize too early to somebody who's angry. Because, yeah, you are sorry is not the thing you really want to hear. Just so you know. Alcohol and dementia, which may again tie back to part of our previous one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So alcohol has been long been a, um, a drug of choice when I'm anxious, when I'm emotional, when I'm impulsive. It's a medication that numbs you. Um, so it has a numbing property. It was used as an anesthetic. Um, in early surgeries because you can't feel anything uh, really when it's in action, when you give it like to a high degree. But it also um, numbs you to emotional pain and sometimes spiritual pain, and it makes you not feel bad. But it actually does something else, which it revs you up at first because it gives you a sugar rush because it's, you know, dehydrated glucose, <laughs> actually sugar. And so it revs you up, it feels no pain. And so you've got this impulse problem and you're often doing things you wouldn't have done otherwise saying things you wouldn't have said um and then you run low and your brain says well you need more and so what happens is you can have alcohol poisoning you can actually get so much on board um, that it's very dangerous and you can kill brain cells and um, those are called binges when people go on binges um, and recovery, you know, you can cause damage to your brain that you can't recover from over time. Next question. Why does mom seem normal to everybody else, but not to me? Yeah. So we have different cells. We have that outer shell. We have that medium shell. We have that deep inner shell. So many of us, um, for people on the outside, you know, acquaintances, people I don't see often, I have a I have a public persona. And so how I am in public, I recognize public as public place and I behave in my public self. But when I get in the family unit, if I felt comfortable being in a certain role and now you're saying, no, we're going to switch that or I'm having trouble, I'm more likely to show that in my home than I would out in public. And so the person I feel safest with is the one who unconditionally supports me or I'm most familiar with. And so you're also familiar with me. And so you might notice things that other people, you know, just on brief acquaintance or in the public sector wouldn't pick up on. But I noticed things, you, you, you tried to sign the check. I know how to sign a check. Why are you taking over and signing the checks for me? Well, mom, we talked, I never said you could do that. And what happens is I wait till we're in the car to do that. But I'm, when we get to anger, I'm boiling that you took the checkbook and signed your name to my account. That isn't even legal. And then I make the mistake of saying, well, mom, you remember you gave me permission. I never gave you permit. Oh, who made a mistake? Oh, yeah. Um, Remember not to make that mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Tiba, our last one. Does it ever get better? Because we see a, a preponderance of, of uh, solutions, pills, mm -hmm. treatments yeah. online. You know, can I cure mom? No, you can't cure mom. Here's the tricky part. Uh, if you have a vascular dementia, if you have an event, when your brain recovers from a specific vascular event, it looks like you're getting better. 
But the problem is there's still brain destruction that's happening over time. So yeah, but not really. And so the tricky thing is, yeah, there are days that go much better. There are moments that absolutely shine. But overall, are you going to recover and come back from dementia? No, because it's a brain deterioration disease. Once you have that transition into dementia, there is not clear, there is no evidence that we can reverse out of dementia completely and we're in the free zone. There's no full remission from cancer is possible. Full remission from dementia, not possible. Can we deal with symptoms? Yeah. Could we do a better job of dealing with symptoms so somebody's life works better? Absolutely for a period of time. But ultimately, we're going to have to modify the environment, the health, the support, because ultimately this disease is progressive right now. We don't have a way to halt it in its tracks. Or you know, to... we, we get hundreds of questions. I have to cut you off because of our time constraints. I have hundreds of questions and you have hundreds of answers, but we don't always ask the right ones for people. They want to know something specific to their situation and we get that. So, so can I talk to somebody at, at Positive Approach? You absolutely can at consults at tipasnow.com or you can call our 800 number um, because we respond to that as well. You can do info at tipasnow.com if you can't remember anything else or you can come to our website and fill out a request via email if that works better for you because we want to wait for you to come in. Uh, out of the loneliness. And uh, I have a question and I don't know what to do. Tifa, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. You've been listening to the Dementia Care Partner Podcast, sponsored by Positive Approach to Care Certifications Program and the Amanda Mosher Scholarship. If you would like to become a sponsor for this podcast and other free programs that Tifa and her team provide each month, please visit tifasnow.com forward slash sponsor. Hi, I'm Tifa Snow. And you just found our YouTube channel and watched one of our videos. I'm the owner and founder of Positive Approach to Care. Thanks for watching. And if you liked, if you have a comment about, or you would, please share it with people you know. Oh, and if you haven't yet done it, consider subscribing. We'll let you know when the next new video comes out. And you might want to visit our website, www.tipasnow.com, where you'll find other resources as well. See you there.